So I want to welcome you to our third session in our class, Understanding your, the End Times. And this is part one. We're still in part one, Scoffers and Doctrines of Demons. And uh, I just want to just say thank you to everybody out there who is in our Forerunner School. And just the hunger you have and the desire you have for the truth is, is awesome. I just am so thankful for you. Anyway, um, there's a... There's a uh, scripture in James where James talks about be quick to hear but slow to, slow to speak. And I, I really believe that's the time we're living in right now is there is, there is so much noise out there. And, you know, we, we need to be able to hear our brothers and sisters in Christ with a different perspective, with a different view, and be slow to speak and just hear what they have to say. And so in this session, it's uh, session three it's called the Seven Mountain Mandate. And what I'm going to do in this session is I'm going to talk about, uh, you may or may not have heard of Seven Mountain, the Seven Mountain Mandate or Seven Mountain Theology. And so anyway, I'm going to give you, I'm going to go through this in, in two sessions, in this session and in the next session, session four. And as we go through this, um, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned in uh, session two that I was going to name names of different teachers who teach the Seven Mountain Mandate, just so we have an idea of the different people that are teaching this. And I have had a change of heart, just to be honest with you. I, I wrestled over this quite a bit in prayer. Um, and, and the main reason why I feel like, I felt like not to name names, I mean, there's one, one quote I will read, but not to name names, is primarily because of the time we live in. I mean, we really live in, that. there is such a division right now in America, and there's such a division in the church. And um, even though I think naming names and quoting people, especially when it's written in a book, is important, I just feel like the timing of it right now is not good to name names. And so that's why I am not going to do that. I said that in session two, but... I've, uh, I've since changed my mind on that just, just because of that. Just, I just felt like, you know, I'm actually, t I'm actually recording this the day after Trump supporters stormed the halls of Congress. And, you know, it's just, it just didn't feel right to name names. So, but I'm still going to quote them. I'm just not going to say who said it. But I, I want you to know as we start this session that the Seven Mountain Mandate is not a it's not a fringe teaching in a liberal seminary. It's not a flaky teaching. Well, I mean, it, there is some flakiness to it, I, I would say. But it's not something in, this, in a flaky charismatic church out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, this is really spreading uh, big time in the charismatic movement. And so it's, it's a very, very important teaching that we understand about the Seven Mountain Mandate. But we have to be, and I, I just come, just to be honest, I come teaching this there is a lot of nuance that we have to capture. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of uh, middle, we have to come into the messy middle to find the truth. There, there's, there's some great things, I think, about the Seven Mountain Mandate that we need. I'm going to talk about that. And there's some real serious error I'm going to talk about as well. So we need to be able to hear both sides of the argument and exactly what people teach, because I, I believe uh, there's some things, like I said, there's some very good things that me as being a premillennial, with a premillennial view of the end times, I needed this. You know, God corrected me in some areas of the need to be salt and light. That's what this teaching does really well. Uh, but at the same time, we cannot embrace theological error. So I'm going to be talking about that. This is one of those things where I'm going to really rely on the Holy Spirit to bring nuance and, and just grace. We want to have a lot of grace. Um, as we get started here, I just want to go over some definitions that um, I talked about in session two, but I want to give it in session three here, just as a review. Uh, the first definition I want to give is partial preterism, partial preterism. And so you probably remember, but just to, because I'm going to be using this terminology quite a bit in this session is partial preterism believes that many of the prophecies of Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation were fulfilled in 70 AD. That's partial preterism. Post-millennialism or dominionism, you can go by e either name, post-millennialism or dominionism. And again, I don't usually like using really big 
theological words, but it's important that we understand what these mean. And so this definition is, it believes that we're currently living in the millennial kingdom and the church will bring Jesus back after she takes dominion over the, seven na over the, over the nations through a great revival. And a lot of, in fact, a lot of the seven mountain teaching is post-millennial or dominion in its theology. And the third one is premillennialism. And that's what this class teaches. And this is the belief that Jesus will return before the millennial kingdom and after a period of great tribulation on the earth. And this class comes from that perspective. So that, that's where we're coming from. Just to, if I use those terms in there, just so that you're not like, what, post-millennial, pre-millennial, partial preterist? I'm really not trying to use those words to impress you or whatever. It's more just, it'll help us as we get deeper into this conversation, what those terms mean. And I, I would encourage you, get the notes and review what those mean. Um, it's important when it comes to eschatology of understanding those things. So just to give you an idea of the origins of the seven mountain mandate, and I'm going to explain in a bit what it is, what the teaching is, but the origins, I believe, was truly from the Lord. And so you may have heard the story or not, but in 1975, Bill Bright, a very respected leader and an evangelical leader, and Lauren Cunningham, another re very respected leader with Youth with a Mission, uh, independently, these two leaders were spending time with the Lord, and they both received a revelation from the Holy Spirit that if you want to take, if you want to win people for Christ, you've got to impact the culture. You, you got to take the gospel, and, they, and the Lord gave them seven areas, and he called it seven mountains. Now, again, these are two independent revelations. In fact, they don't even know the Lord speaking these revelations to them until they get together. But the seven mountains that the Lord uh, highlighted to each one of them was government, economics, education, family, religion, arts and entertainment, and media. And so what happens is the Lord was, uh, based on the story, is the Lord was, was encouraging them, if you want to really make an impact in the culture and you want to win as, much, as many people as you can for Jesus Christ, then you've got to learn to, in, to take the, you've got to learn to take the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ, into these seven mountains of culture. And so... Surprisingly, when they get together, I don't know how long it was after they received the revelation, Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham, they share with each other, uh, this is what the Lord spoke to me and this is what the Lord spoke to me. And amazingly, the Lord had given them the very same revelation. Then a little bit later, they found out another very prominent leader at the time, Francis Schaefer, Schaefer had the very same revelation. So that's, I mean, you, you just can't, you just cannot make that stuff up. You cannot make that up. And so, so I believe that the, the seven mountain mandate as a strategy to take the gospel into government and education and media, uh, arts and entertainment and all the different seven mountains of culture, so to speak, uh, began as a true Holy Spirit given strategy for the church to be salt and light and culture. But nevertheless, what happens is over time, this, what was given as a Holy Spirit strategy to preach the gospel and to impact the culture, influence the culture as salt and light, was hijacked by partial preterist theology and dominionism or post-millennialism theology. And so what became a strategy to influence the culture and impact the culture and win people to Jesus Christ became then the church needs to conquer, invade Babylon and conquer the seven mountains so Jesus can come back. And so that's where we get into, in my opinion, quite a bit of error. So anyway, we're going we're gonna to dive into all that. And, and, and the other thing I want to say as we get into this, it would be a mistake to say, all seven mountain teachers are alike. They're not. They're not all alike. Uh, there, there's nuance in different seven mountain teachers. And, and in fact, uh, there's a slide I want to show. Um, slide I want to show here. Um, the spectrum of seven mountain teaching. And so I think it's very important that we see this slide is that 
uh, on the, the green check mark is, is when the seven mountain teaching is taught to be salt and light and culture, I think, I think that, is a, that is a spot on thing. The church needs to be salt and light in these seven areas of culture. But if you notice the blue line here is where, where we get into error is the mild error. And, and again, the mild error to me is not a big deal. I mean, it is a, it, it's not as big of a deal as some of the other stuff. But the mild error is misinterpret a few verses. Um, you know, it's a mild error. It's important, but it's not, to me, it's not serious. But where you start getting into real concern, in my opinion, is when the medium to serious error, where you misinterpret many verses to form a doctrine... And then you, uh, you the, 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 what is the most serious of error is you get into partial preterism and post-millennialism in your eschatology. That to me is where it gets very dangerous. And that is really the area I'm going to be hitting on in this teaching. Is in this teaching, when I talk about the seven, when I, I'm going to use the phrase in this teaching, the seven mountain teachers, okay? So I'm not going to say some seven mountain teachers or several or many. I'm just going to say some seven, or I'm just going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to say seven mountain teachers. And when I, when I talk about that, I'm going to be highlighting the teachers who teach medium to serious error. This, this spectrum here of those who, are, who have formed a doctrine by taking many verses out of context. And I'm also going to hit on those who have actually embraced or embodied post-millennialism and partial preterism into their, their view. So in the notes you can see, actually, let's turn in our script, turn in our Bibles to 2 Peter 3, verse 16. And Peter was writing, and we mentioned this in the last session, or, more, or yeah, one of the last sessions, is Peter is writing, and he's talking about Paul. I, I love this. It's great. It's just like, you know, it's even, it's encouraging sometimes to be like, even Peter, the great apostle, was confused by some of the things Paul wrote. And he said in 2 Peter 3, 16, he said some things, and if you look at the context of what Paul's writing about, he says some things are hard to understand. He's talking about the end times. He's talking about the end times. He said some things that Paul writes about, they're hard to understand. And that probably encourages us, doesn't it? I mean, it's like, okay, if Peter, the, the water walker, was confused about what Paul wrote, then, you know, if we get confused, it makes us feel a little bit better. But he said, some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable distort. Now, that word in the Greek, distort, means to twist or to pervert. To twist or to pervert. And I believe this is what uh, um, some seven mountain teachers do. They take verses out of context... And taking it out of context, they pervert what God was saying to, his origi to the original audience who heard it. That's very important. And there's a quote in our notes here on page two. Is uh, Theologian Donald Carson said, his father taught him this saying, as it's so great when we're going to come into scripture, is a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. That's a mouthful. I'll say it one more time. A text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. What that means is this. It's a pretty big word. But what this means is when, whenever a teacher, and that would include any teacher, whenever a teacher takes a verse of Scripture out of its original context, out of what the author in, in intended, out of what the, the historical setting, the time frame, what, is, what the audience would have understood, to whom the author was speaking, the culture of the day, the author's purpose for writing the chapter or the book, and uh, the overall narrative of Scripture. Whenever it's taken out of context, and even, uh, even how it's been understood throughout church history, whenever a, a teacher takes a Scripture out of context, he forms a pretext for a proof text, meaning that Whenever, whenever you take it out of context, out of the original context of what the author intended, of what the historical setting was, and all that stuff, it's very dangerous because it becomes a proof text. In other words, it becomes their proof for an already preconceived doctrine they have already established. And they use that scripture to justify, to justify their doctrine. And that's where it becomes very, very dangerous. So that's... That's where we're going here. So 
And, and I want to just, I want to fairly, um, I want to describe what seven mountain theology is. And I'm, again, I'm talking between the medium and the serious air of, of seven mountain theology. According to seven mountain theology, the great commission is more than discipling individuals. When Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples in all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said that, he was, in, in Matthew 28, he was not only talking, in, or in that, that specific verse, he was talking about discipling the nations, not individuals, but the mind molders and the influencers at the top of every seven, all the seven mountains, government, education, business, uh, religion, family, all those. To influence and impact and transform a culture, we've got to affect the mind molders in those seven mountains. And so, um, so that, that's, what, that's what they believe. The idea is that the gospel must penetrate into these influential people. Now, they always, they, they like to use phrases like invade, we need to invade Babylon. We need to, we need to bring heaven to earth. We need to occupy uh, we need to occupy until Jesus comes. Now, another thing they, they like to say, seven mountain teachers, is Acts 3.21, is that Jesus Christ cannot return until the period of restoration of all things spoken by the mouth of the holy prophets. And, and two of their scriptures, they always use what the prophets said, or, or they, they use frequently, or God's glory is going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea, and the, the nations are going to stream to the mountain of the Lord's house. Isaiah 2.2. And they also quote Isaiah 11. The other thing they teach is that Psalms 110.1 is that Jesus Christ is not going to return until, quoting Psalms 10, 110 verse 1, until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. Now that doesn't just mean even demonic ent entities. That means as some seven mountain teachers teach, that would include the church is going to destroy the Antichrist, the church is going to destroy the false prophet and the harlot Babylon. That's what a lot, that's what I say some go that far is that Jesus is not coming back until the church, the ecclesia, God's government in the earth uh, uh, brings the dominion of the kingdom of God and, and crushes every one of God's enemies, then Jesus is going to come back. Another thing they, uh, they, they like to quote a lot of times is Genesis 128 is God gave Adam a mandate to take dominion over the earth. And so the way that mandate is fulfilled is through the church taking dominion in the seven mountains of culture. Now, the question is, okay, well, how exactly is that going to happen? I mean, there's, there's a lot of nations that are hostile to the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. How exactly is that going to happen? Well, they believe, and I, I believe a revival is coming as well, but they believe a, a great awakening, and I believe a great awakening is coming. But they believe a, the greatest revival in history is coming that's going to be marked by signs and wonders, and I believe that also. Uh, is going to come, and over a billion souls are going to be saved. And it's through this great revival that the church is going to be able to penetrate into all seven mountains of culture, and the nations are going to be completely transformed. And they like, and a lot of times they quote Revelation eleven fifteen that the kingdom of God will then progressively uh, increase until all seven mountains are conquered, and Jesus can come back. So that that's just kind of in a nutshell what a lot of seven mountains teachers teach. Now, one, I'm just going to read some quotes here. What one seven mountain teacher, pretty prominent teacher, he said, uh, he said in his book, the lamb was slain, making the ultimate sacrifice to enable us to disciple or instruct the nations in these seven foundations of culture so that we would in turn deliver them to him Thus fulfilling Revelation 11:15, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign. And he goes on to say, uh, in Revelation 17, a harlot who sits on a beast with seven heads, 
that are seven mountains is a demonic entity, is, is a woman who is a demonic entity. And this demonic entity must be displaced from the mountains or seats of power. This is our mission that we were co-commissioned by Jesus to do. And so according to this teaching is that, is that the church has a commission to overthrow the harlot Babylon. And that would also include, uh, in, in quoting, is we will take on the false prophet and the beast and we're going to annihilate both of them. When they are crushed, we will come to the Lord and say the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God. Now going further, this teacher says, we will present the nations, to, uh, the nations of the world to the Lord as his possessions. They will be the dowry that the Father is providing for us to present to the bridegroom. So just to be clear, not all seven mountain teachers would agree with that, okay? But this just gives you some idea of the train of thought. Is the idea is that it is the, the, the Lord is not going to come back until the church goes and conquers and takes dominion over the nations and invades Babylon with the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God progressively increases until Jesus comes back. And it's through the greatest revival in history. And again, I believe with all my heart, God is going to send a third great awakening to America. And God is going to send uh, the final outpouring of the Spirit before His Son comes back. But I don't believe it is for the purpose of transforming nations. I believe it's for the purpose of transforming the bride of Christ. Um, so, yeah, that, that's basically the idea. That's the idea. One, one other leader said, charismatic leader. And again, if I name the names, a lot of you would recognize the leaders. The, the leaders that are saying these things are very well known, very prominent, have great influence in the body of Christ. So, was, again, this is not a fringe teaching. This is very much influencing so much of the charismatic church. I don't know the exact percentage, eight, 60, 70, 80% of the church has been influenced by Seven Mountain Teaching in one form or another. But one of the leaders said, as fanatical as it may sound to fundamental evangelical Christians, the church is destined to subdue all things and put all things under Christ's feet before he literally returns from heaven. And sometimes you'll hear, you'll hear teachers say something like, you know, we, the church needs to stop looking to the clouds for Jesus to come back. We're not commissioned for that. Instead, we're to occupy until Jesus, re, until Jesus returns. And so anyway, that, that's kind of what the seven mountain mandate teaches in a nutshell. Now, again, I want to be very fair to this and say that there's some good things out of this teaching. There really is. The, the, the one thing that the seven mountain mandate does very well is it mobilizes the church to be salt and light in culture. And how many of you realize we desperately need to be salt and light? That's one of the, the uh, pillars of the Sermon on the Mount, is you be light that shines in darkness. You be salt that preserves the culture from decay. And so the Seven Mountain Mandate as a strategy to penetrate into the culture, as a strategy to go into the areas of cultural influence I believe it does a very, very good job. In fact, as a premillennial, I'm a premillennial in my view of in the end times. As a premillennial, I have been very um, challenged by, by the seven mountain teachers to go out into culture and be salt and light in a much greater way. And that's good. That is good. And I, I applaud that teaching to get the church out of the four walls and into the culture to preserve the culture and for the kingdom of God to advance. That's a, that is a good, good thing. And so I, I, I praise God for that. I mean, you know, it is just even listening to some of the testimonies of those who have, you know, they were premillennial and they moved to more of a partial preterist, postmillennial view of the end times. Just listening to some of their testimony, your heart kind of breaks some because you see that a lot of times their experience is what turned them towards this, in, in my opinion, a false teaching. Um, you know, you hear of, well, they saw the extremes of those in the premillennial camp who said, okay, Jesus is coming back any moment. He's going to rapture us. We're just going to go camp out in the bunker, hide away in the mountain. We're just, we're not going to worry about being, a, you know, we're not going to worry about education. We're not going to worry about making money and prospering. We're not going to worry about being successful or leaving a legacy to our children. In other words, they become these absolute failures 
waiting for Jesus to come back. And these guys look at that and go, this is the fruit of this teaching. I'm rejecting it. And, and that's how a lot of them form, in my opinion, the partial preterist post-millennial view is not necessarily from the scriptures, but from experience. And I, I mean, I would agree with their, their view on that. I, I mean, as a premillennial myself, we need to make sure that our eschatology is not keeping us in the four walls of the church waiting, just uh, merely waiting for Jesus to come back. Now, we do need to wait for Jesus to come back, and we do need to watch for his return, but we also need to be in the culture as salt and light. And the Seven Mountain Teaching, in my opinion, does a great job doing that. Um, I heard one prominent leader in the charismatic movement who teaches Seven Mountain uh, Theology, and he was, uh, he was given his testimony, and he grew up in the Jesus People movement and was really influenced by Hal Lindsey and the late great planet Earth. And you know, that book sold millions of copies, and so many people were just thinking, okay, Jesus is literally coming back at any moment. And you know, people sold their houses and they sold their cars and they said, why do we need money? Why do we need education? Because Jesus is coming back, you know, and he looks back 40 something years later or whatever. And he says, okay, Jesus hasn't come back yet. And, you know, that led, like I said, that led him to embrace the other view of eschatology. So anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of the background here, but what's good about it? Again, the, what's, what's great about it? is this, this teaching does get the church outside of the four walls into the seven mountains of culture, if you want to call it that, government education, economics, religion, arts and entertainment, media, and it, and it really allows the kingdom of God to influence and impact culture. That is good. That We desperately, desperately need that, even in what we're going through right now in our country. I mean, what would, the, what would, what would it look like if our founding fathers said, you know, Jesus is going to come back any moment, let's just not worry. We've had this great awakening and, you know, the, the soul of America was converted and we're just going to sit back and the King of England wants to put a yoke on our neck. Well, he's probably the Antichrist anyway. And, you know, we're just going to let God's sovereign will be done. I mean, what would have happened if our founding fathers had that attitude? We would never have this great nation of America, even though right now we're in a total mess. We would have not had the founding of America, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. I mean, what would have happened if William Wilberforce said, well, you know what, I'm not going to uh, fight against slavery because Jesus is going to come back soon and Jesus is going to bring justice when he comes back. I'm just going to go wait in my prayer closet for him. And he never fought against slavery. You see, uh, what about Martin Luther King Jr.? You know, Jesus is going to come back and I'm going to go hide in my bunker and wait for him because everything's going to get terrible and he never fought against racial injustice. My point is, is everyone who holds a premillennial view of the end times, including myself, can learn so much from our brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ who teach the seven mountains uh, theology, doctrine, about the need for the church to be salt and light that impacts the culture. We need that. We really do. I need that. We all need that in a greater way. We've got to be out. We've got to be a countercultural kingdom influencing wherever God has placed us. And so that, that's what's, you know, that's what's so good. In fact, a lot of the, a lot of the revivalists in the first and second great awakening were post-millennial in their eschatology. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, um, George, I, I think George Whitfield, the Wesley brothers, Charles Finney, he's the second great awakening. Um, they were post-millennial in their eschatology. So in a, from a practical standpoint, there is great benefit in, in the church saying, okay, well, we need to get out, out of the four walls. We need revival. We need the kingdom of God to penetrate. We need the kingdom of God to influence. We need the kingdom of God to expand. Um, so there's great, great practical benefit to that. Absolutely. Revi you know, the things I love about it is optimistic. It's, you know, we're, we, we're, you know, we want revival. We want to see the, the nations, the, the culture in the nations impacted and influenced by the kingdom of God. I mean, all of that is really good. I mean, you think about, think about this for a second. Think about the founding of America. I, I think the greatest example, if we want an example, the, the ultimate case study of what the you know what it looks like when a nation is influenced and impacted by Christians who are salt and light in culture 
Just look no further than America's foundings. And I, I've been studying recently The Light and the Glory by Peter Marshall and David Manuel. It's a book that looks at America's history from 1492 to 1793. I highly recommend, I highly, highly recommend you get that book, especially if you live in America, because there are evil powers trying to rewrite our history. And if we lose our history and we don't know from where we came, then we're going to lose so much. And so American Christians need to know the, the true history of America that has not been uh, rewritten or any of that. We need to know our history. And so I highly recommend that book. And in that book, what you see, what you see in that book is God had a plan for America. God had a plan for America. And so the Reformation, you know, right after the Reformation, spearheaded by Martin Luther, it deeply impacted two groups of people in England. The pilgrims, or they weren't really called pilgrims, they were called separatists, and then the Puritans. The separatists, who we now know as the pilgrims, the separatists, um, they wanted to reform the church, of, or they believed that the Church of England, which was a lot like the Catholic Church at the time, that there was really no hope of reform. And so they separated from the Church of England. And because of that, they began to get persecuted, heavily persecuted. So they fled to Holland. And in Holland, the conditions after a number of years became so intense. And finally, they, they realized that God was sending them to the, they called it the wilderness of America. God was sending them to the wilderness of America and so you know the story of the pilgrims and, you know, the, it was really, I look at the pilgrims as the initial seed God planted in the wilderness of America for a nation God wanted to establish. And then about a decade later come the Puritans and uh, John Winthrop le led the Puritans who were very much like the, the pilgrims, but they stayed within the Church of England. And John Winthrop, and I've read the, or I said this in a, previous sermon, but it's pretty powerful. John Winthrop was talking, he was journaling, you know, wrestling, okay, Lord, do you want me to go to America? Do you want me to leave my family and go to America? And he's wrestling through this. And he writes down in his journal, which we have now uh, documented. And he says, number one, it will be a service to the church of great consequence to carry the gospel into those parts of the world and to raise a bulwark against the kingdom of Antichrist, which the Jesuits labor to rear up in those parts. The Jesuits at the time, and still are, were fighting against the Reformation, trying to keep the Catholic Church pure. Uh, they were, and, and so they had penetrated into America, and Winthrop said, you know, we want to come and fight against the Antichrist. And then he also said, all, number two, he said, all other churches of Europe are brought to desolation due to persecution. Who knows but that God has provided this place to be a refuge for many whom he means to save out of the general calamity and seeing the church has no place left to fly but into the wilderness. What better work can there be but to go and provide tabernacles and food for her against what comes against her? And so this was to me, this right here, you know, for centuries historians have debated what's the destiny of America? What's the purpose of America? And I believe Winthrop, who became the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, Winthrop, I believe, articulated God's vision for this nation is that America is meant to be a refuge against persecution. It's meant to be a resistance to the Antichrist. And it's meant to be a sender of the gospel into the nations. And so I believe at the very beginning, God was moving. And so the Puritan movement in New England was, was growing. And all of a sudden, you know, like any other movement, it began, the fire began to go down, the light began to dim. And then at that moment, that, that Puritan movement was actually the multiplication of the pilgrim's initial seed in the wilderness of America. The Puritan movement was the multiplication of that seed. But it was the first great awakening led by Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and Charles and John Wesley. It was, it was the first great awakening where the Spirit of God breathed upon and rained down upon that initial seed. And through that brought one of the greatest moves of the, of the Holy Spirit in history. From about, uh, from about I don't know, the, for about 10, 20 years, the, the great awakening just moved down the 13 colonies. And you know, it talks about Jonathan Edwards. He was just, 
He was this very super intelligent, monotone uh, Puritan preacher in New England, and he would just get up to preach and just read his notes, and people all of a sudden would come under the power of the Holy Spirit and conviction, and they would squeeze, feeling like they were about to go to hell if they didn't repent, the, the, the pew in front of them. And, and, you know, God just would pour out his spirit through Jonathan Edwards up in New England. But it was George Whitfield who was a, a preacher, a young revivalist in England, and he felt compelled, I've got to go to the 13 colonies in America and I've got to make them one nation under God. Don't, I mean, isn't that amazing? <clears throat> and so Whitfield, they say that Whitfield had this voice that would thunder and 30,000 people could hear him speak without microphones and speakers. That's, that's pretty amazing. But they say George Whitfield did, uh, uh, spoke 18,000 sermons in his career. And his vision was, I want to unite the 13 colonies of America so they would become one nation under God. And he became a drink offering. He became an absolute, uh, gave his life for revival, gave his life that America might be saved. And he preached 18,000 sermons, even sermons, and even on his deathbed, just he's, his health is failing. And he says, if I could go out one more time, he goes out one last time and preach, I forget exactly how many he preaches to, but God used George Whitfield so powerfully in this nation. And a lot of historians look at the first great awakening and they say the first great awakening was the national conversion of America. That is, oh, so powerful. The national conversion of America. Uh, Whitfield preached from 1740 to 1770, and his message was, you must be born again. You must experience the new birth. And so after the ministry of George Whitfield is one, it was uh, written in the light and the glory, that one crown appointed governor was writing back to England, and he said this about Americans, if you ask Americans who is their master? He will tell you he has none, nor any governor but Jesus Christ. And so that gave, Ray, uh, that gave a cry up and down the 13 colonies as we have no king but Jesus. The first great awakening for the very first time in our history caused a nation to come under God as one nation under God. And a lot of people don't realize this. A lot of people don't realize this. But it was the first great awakening, many historians believe, that led to the, the Revolutionary War. That's amazing, isn't it? It's the first great awakening. God moved to save a nation, the national conversion of America. That doesn't mean every single person was born again, but many, many were born again. And they, they get saved, and all of a sudden, even the preachers in America are preaching. The, the, they're preaching in these fiery pulpits, and they're saying, that you know we have been we have experienced this move of God, and they they quoted Galatians five one is that it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't be yoked again under a yoke of slavery. And they're 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 preaching it's all around America. It was led by the preachers. It was led by the preachers, affected by the Great Awakening. And their logic was this: God moved in an outpouring of His Spirit. A nation was born again. Therefore, we cannot come under England's oppressive yoke of tyranny and slavery. God, has, God wants this nation to be free. It's powerful. Powerful. And you know the, you know the story, the Revolutionary War. It was the, great, it was the greatest miracle, one of the greatest miracles in history. A nation fighting the most powerful army in the world with I mean, a ragtag army. And God supernaturally... Uh, delivers them from England in a supernatural way, even against all odds when it seems as if they're going to be defeated and destroyed. God, as the captain of heaven's army, uh, delivers them. And when the war is over, the founding fathers, they're like, okay, that's the easy part. The easy part is beating Great Britain in a war. The hard part is what do we do? How do we have self-governance? What kind of government do we create? You know, a lot of people wanted George Washington to be the king. But they're like, what kind of government do we create? And it was Ben Franklin who said uh, his famous quote, uh, I can't, I don't have it off the top of my head, but he was basically saying, look, if we have been praying to defeat this empire how are we going to form a constitution apart from prayer? And it was Ben Franklin who said that, that led the, the members of 
the f- Congress who would as- write the Constitution into daily prayers for God to lead them and God to guide them and, and how to draft the Constitution. And I believe the Constitution was Spirit-inspired. And that doesn't mean it comes close to Scripture, but the Holy Spirit got into the Constitution. And it's the most incredible form of government that I, I believe God has ever given to mankind by the Spirit of God. Even our three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches were inspired by Isaiah 33, verse 22. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. I mean, there's so many, so many more details that I'm leaving out. But, and again, this doesn't mean that America is synonymous with the kingdom of God. This is not, not, this is not Christian nationalism. Uh, There's a lot of talk about that these days. It doesn't mean the kingdom of God invaded and took over America, but it does mean, this is my point here, it does mean that America in its foundings was heavily influenced and impacted by Christians who functioned as salt and light in in these seven mountains of culture. Were they, I mean, as much as they had media or whatever back then, which I'm sure they had some form of it. But the point is, is Christians were marked by a great revival, and that great revival caused them to uh, influence and impact the founding of what I believe is the greatest nation in history, in my opinion. That's my opinion. And so the point of that is, is that, to me, to me when I look at the founding of America, that is, that is really the model of what salt and light looks like when God gets involved in it. And, you know, um, I think the, the seven mountain teaching that encourages Christians, be salt and light in government, be salt and light in economics, be salt and light in media, be salt and light in family, whatever, whatever mountain that would is. I think that's, that part of it is really, really good. So I guess to summarize this is from a practical standpoint, there's, there's so much good that the seven mountain teaching does it's, it's more of a theological standpoint where I believe it gets into that serious error where it's mixed in with partial preterism and postmillennialism. That's where it becomes error. And so in the next session, we're going to talk about what those errors are and what I believe the truth is about it.